but there's something a little but yeah let's uh get into it there's something a little off about farina you know it, I know it, our Lakino knows it, but not many people in game are questioning it. And I, I mean, it is a bit weird. weird. She doesn't really so much that like powerful. Fischl, seemingly role playing as someone she isn't, but perhaps wishes she could be, or maybe she has to be. And it's mm. left her more than a little insecure and even more emotionally unstable. But why is yes. why is an Archon so unsure of herself? Why is she so frightened of a mortal of all things? I mean, sure, Arlequino is ranked pretty high at number four of the Fatui Harbingers, but yeah. Nahida had a face off against Dottori, who's ranked even higher, and she didn't even Yeah, finish. number two. She faced him head on, but that was so cool. Farina begged that was so for her cool. life, not even knowing Arlequino's identity or power level. And I just think that's so strange. I mean, I agree with what um, Brand said. Uh, I think it was Brand who said all of this, I'm pretty sure, which is um, that... Or maybe you said this at different parts, but um, which I'm going to put them together, is uh, that uh, that Gnosis... Uh, um, Frida is the Hydro um, Archon, but um, the Gnosis is in the um, Oratories. But, and then since... I mean, because what um, I think Venti and Ahida, like we know, we've learned from them that the beliefs of people what give the power, uh, give the Archons like higher power, pretty much. So I feel like the Oratories is taking the power to form Indonesian or whatever it's called to power the city. So I feel like that power has been used to power the city rather than going to the Archon. So that's why Farina doesn't have any power. That's what I've got up to right now from listening to other people. But yeah. But yeah. There's something that doesn't add up here. So I decided to investigate a little, poke some things, and see what pokes back. But you know what pokes <laughs> back? Child. Child poked back, and now I'm left here a little bit baffled. And yeah, this, this, yeah, this title is... Is it uh, his Hydro Vision? Because so his Hydro Vision acted up. I'm ready to share my findings with all of you. You We're act one. With a little bit of a contextual so analysis of the circumstances surrounding Farina, and then we're going to shift gears and see what Child has to tell us about her. He's still in the primordial water. To the rest of what's going on in Fontaine. Trust me, it's a little juicier than you think. Like mm. I said, before we can get to the Child bits, we need to establish a few things about Farina first. Like, uh, what kind of species is she? Because yes, that's actually kind of important. Now, most Would we know? Farina is an Oceanid. I mean, the former Hydro Archon Agaria was either the mother of all Oceanids, the very first Oceanid, or the most prominent Oceanid, or all of the above. So it would make sense if Farina was one, too. This is an assumption Her I'm making so good. because thus far, almost every nation's Archon has either been the same species as the predominant magical species of that region, or at least a very similar one. For example, Venti is a wind wisp, and there are no yes. other magical species in Mondstadt that we know yes. of yet, so this is accurate by default. Zhang Li is the prime of the Adepti, meaning he's either the king, leader, ancestor, or creator of the other Adepti, and thus an Adeptus himself. And before you try to argue that he's a dragon, no, 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 he's not. <laughs> he takes the shape of a dragon, but he is not a bishop. This is something he confirms himself in a conversation with Ajdaha. He's just a dragon-shaped Adeptus, okay? Now, Nahida is a being born of a magic tree, Ermansol, and the Aranara are also beings born of a magic tree, which was pulled from Ermansol. As for A and Makoto, well, the They're dominant assisted. magic species in Inazuma are the yokai, so they too must be yokai. Oh. I've seen some people suggest that they might be like Bakazori or like Sandals yokai since they're twins and shoes come in pairs. I don't really have any good evidence for this huh. because it's not really my theory, but this still seems like the most logical assumption to me for now. Now, Fontaine's most dominant magical species are the Oceanids. Melazines don't count. They're not native since they came from the flesh of a Conrian dragon and they were born quite yeah. a long time. Sorry, maybe, uh, uh, okay. Just wanted to make sure my voice was recording. I'm after Agaria's death. Yeah. And by this logic, Farina should also be an Oceanid. So, proceeding on the assumption that Farina is an Oceanid, what do we know about Oceanids? They could take the form of a human? 
because uh, we learned that, I mean, we learned that from the 3.8 quest and from the recent poetry quest. Well, we learned from Rodea, as well. Andora, and others that oceanids are <laughs> exceptionally sensitive to the emotional states of others. If you have impure emotions that are and carried that. in water, this is and what the oceanids call bitter water. For example, when Rodea thought Endora was there to assassinate her, her rage and fear made the waters of Liwa and Mondstadt very bitter. It's also said that many of the oceanids left Fontaine many years ago for the very same reason. Fontaine had bitter waters. Well, it was that and they also just didn't accept Farina as their Archon, but I digress. We already know that Farina really struggles with her emotional state Aww. and experiences incredible bouts of loneliness and sadness, so if she's directly connected to Fontaine's waters as the Archon, then her emotional state would, uh, flavor the waters in a kind of bitter way. Hmm. Arlecchino also tells that us why, that he is that why the Farina is cursed, and I don't know about you, but knowing that I was cursed might also affect my emotional state pretty badly. <laughs> Now, in Genshin, water itself is closely tied to emotions. Early on in Chapter 4, Lynette tells us that tears contain one's strongest emotions, and since tears are water, they gather in the Fountain of Lucene, which is where all the waters of Tevat It's gather. how you can hear Farina. Tears are very important for a few reasons. For one, Farina is the voices. drawing tears all alone at the, the end voices. of the prophecy and just so happens to have several teardrop shapes all over her outfit. And yes, I know they might just be water droplets, but they could also be both. Now, shush. <laughs> Secondly, it's stated okay. that Agaria created the Oceanids from her tears, which I know is a statement that is directly contested almost immediately after it is stated in this book here, but... I think I have enough evidence to prove both statements true at the same time, and we're going to explore that idea a little bit later on, so just keep it in mind. But one of the most unique traits of an Oceanid is their ability Bro, to merge this bit together freaks me or out. split this apart. Bit, this bit they are effectively me out. <laughs> singular beings made up of many smaller beings. Collective consciousnesses, if you will. There doesn't seem to be any special requirements for the merging of Oceanids, but there does seem to be a special requirement for an Oceanid to split into smaller parts or to give birth to a new Oceanid. But that requirement is unknown and a little bit unclear. So now that we have all this context, I think we can make a couple of assumptions about what happened with Agaria and Farina. That assumption is that about 500 years ago, Agaria, who was an Archon and also very likely an Oceanid, split herself into smaller pieces just before or during the Cataclysm. A part of her would remain behind in Fontaine under the name of Farina, so the nation would not be without a ruler, while the rest of her would go to the desert in order to stop the Abyss. Oh. Her body would perish there, turning into the Emrita and the Sacred Lotus, while Farina would continue to live in the city. As mm. a fragment of Agaria, she would be smaller, weaker, and possess less overall knowledge than her, so it would make sense if Farina's insecurities stemmed from that. Interesting. However, that is according to Arlecchino, Farina doesn't seem to have the gnosis, and she also suspects that Little Miss Archon is under some kind of curse. Both of these things could contribute to her insecurities and to the state of the waters in Fontaine, but... I think both of these things tie into the prophecy from the start of Chapter 4, wherein everyone in Fontaine will dissolve until only the Hydro Archon is left crying alone on her throne. And I think I can prove it. But to do this, we need to uh -oh. talk about a different insecure Oceanid. Did you know that, happens, that the last summer Ashkai event swaps. before every new region releases serves as an overall plot summary and teaser for the upcoming region? No, really, it, it does. The first Golden Apple Archipelago. I haven't play I didn't play the first year Apple um, Archipelago. So. The event followed the story of Akodomeki's pirate crew after they got stranded on the islands. This group of pirates was part of a rebellion against the Inazuma Shogunate around 500 years ago, and they also stole a very special mechanical puppet, the Magu Kenki. Mmm, could find released that before. Just before Inazuma. And what before. did we do in <laughs> Inazuma? We worked with a rebellion against the Shogunate and had to deal with another mechanical puppet in the form of Scaramouche. Scaramouche! Then, in the second Golden Archipelago, we witnessed the Fatui tinkering with some kind of machine which let dreams manifest into reality, and our companions this time reflected some of the mm. big themes of the upcoming Sumeru region. Yeah, yeah, yeah. story yeah. is foreshadowing Scaramouches based on their shared history, and the other three are a little more allegorical. Shinyan might be a reference to the goddess of flowers due to her mirage's focus on flowers and music, which is something that the goddess of flowers was associated with. 
Mona may reference Deshret and his pursuit of truth and dominance over the stars in the sky, which leaves Fischl as a reference to Nahida, Sh a kid. Holy over shit! The stars in the sky. Hold on, I'm sorry. Bro, Fischl looks so cool there. She looks so cool there with the red eye. As Holy a shit. reference to Nahida, a kid trapped inside Holy a shit. prison of her own making who has to conquer her own insecurities to break free. Emenaka official. And ironically, the last final battle takes place in a library, and Nahida's final battle was against the Academia. So then when we finally got to Sumeru, what did we Interesting, find? Interesting, yeah. The Fatui leveraging some kind of dream machine that trapped everyone inside of some kind of mirage. Then that is actually crazy. Went into God mode, and then we went to the desert area, and that focused almost entirely on Deshret and the Goddess of Flowers. So by that token, That's actually crazy. the event just before Fontaine should contain some relevant themes, right? Well, yeah. For those of you who have already forgotten egg. what happened in the last summer event, <laughs> Alice like... sent Klee to meet a magic friend of hers in the desert who turned out to be an Oceanid willingly isolated within a magic bottle. The Oceanid's name was Idea, and the land inside that bottle was her personal world. Idea is very, very insecure to the point where she often gives up on things before even trying, and she's therefore extremely happy when we offered to help her fix all of the attractions in Bottle Land after they broke. And Farina is While insecure as well. This, however, yeah. we met a lot of different people from all over to that, only to learn that every single person that we'd met within the bottle were actually Hydro Eidolons that borrowed the shape and personality of Adia's previous visitors that she created in order for those people to fulfill their wishes within the confines of Bottle Land. Now, it's never explicitly stated that the Hydro Eidolons are a part of Adia, but they seem to be very closely connected to her abilities. Kokomi claims that Eidolons can turn into any shape, so why not a human's when she's talking about Adia's current human form? And then later, Adia mentions that it's her memories that allows the Eidolons to take the shape of the humans who have visited, so it's very likely that they are fragments of her in some way. At this point, I should mention that the term Eidolon is Greek and means ghost or apparition of the deceased. And you know oh. what's kind of creepy about that? During okay. Acts 1 and 2 of the Chapter 4 Archon Quest, we oh my God. one Oceanid in the Fountain of Lucene. Yeah. And come to find out, she it's was all made the up dead. of all of the dead women yeah. that Vacher killed with primordial water. It's Jesus. an Oceanid made up of the ghosts of dead women. Which is kind of bizarre because oceanids are elemental creatures made up entirely of pure water, and humans are like meat suit things. <laughs> meat and, yeah, suit. Yeah, sure, they oh, have a high gosh. water content in their body, but this still shouldn't be possible unless all of these women were actually made of hydro. So, like ghosts of women made entirely of hydro, you know, like <laughs> hydro idolins. Some of you may already know where I'm going with all of this. Yeah. I've seen at least a couple of theories in the same vein on Reddit, which I will leave in the description box below. And I am not ashamed to admit that I scoffed at them at first because I really didn't think Hoyoverse had the guts to do this, but hear me out because I'm kind of convinced. If Farina is an Oceanid and Fontaine is her bottle land, and the people of Fontaine dissolve in water as illustrated by Vacher's victims, then the reason only people from Fontaine dissolve in primordial water is because they're not really people at all. They're hydro eidolons taking the shapes of people. Oh, Jesus yeah, that's Christ. Right. I'm saying that everyone in Fontaine is already dead, drowned, lost in a watery grave. And that's why eventually for real. Holy sh. So you say. Okay, I think I feel like we say the next side. So you say. For. Um, so Farida raised the land. Made new people as like from Eidolons and stuff, so she wasn't like lonely anymore. Oh my god, Farina will be left on her throne all alone because every other Hydro Eidolon will simply dissolve into the sea until she's the only one left. And so, Liddy and Risley, and you know, everyone else, it's just Eidolons. They're not even real. Oh, Archon God. of a nation with Linny's no already dead in it. That is the original sin, Egeria's sin. She sorry. Let me go back a bit. <laughs> the other hydro eidolon will simply dissolve into the sea until she's the only one left. An archon of a nation with no people in it. 
That is the original sin. Egeria's sin. She says that everyone sinks because they all drowned. They all sank already. Now, I know I said we were going Jesus. to get more information about all of this from the like, yeah, child, insane. not idea, but she I has kind of needed for context. Child is needed for rationale. So yeah, let's what pause this have train of thought this? for a tell. second and shift to tell. talk about him. Child currently has three weird things about him. First, he has a vision that's malfunctioning and just mm, so yeah. happens to be a hydro yeah. vision. <laughs> and second, he has connections to a very weird and powerful whale. And third, he has a guilty verdict given by the oratrice despite his indisputable innocence. But is yeah. he actually indisputably innocent? Because he could be guilty for real and not be aware of it. See, the Oratrice is a machine that passes judgment, and given that it's supposed to be a god machine, it likely houses the Hydronosis just like the Akasha did, just like the Shogun puppet was supposed to. However, the machine also appears to be sentient, implying that either its supposed creator, Farina, knows how to create a successful AI, or, more likely, Uh the machine Uh is hydro-powered and therefore might contain an actual oceanid inside. And since the Gnosis what did that say? contain an actual oceanid inside. <laughs> and since the Gnosis should be Wait, no! Oh, I, did, I kind of skipped over the inside. first one. Step Archon, I'm st- off oh, f- Ashikai, oh my god. Ashikai, oh Jesus and Christ. And since the Gnosis should be inside of the Oratrice, and Egeria was also likely an oceanid, then she'd be the most logical candidate for the oceanid inside of it, right? But hold on a second. Agaria died in the desert, didn't she? That's what we think, well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure a part of her did, but remember what I said earlier? that o- They split off. Yeah. Oceanids can split into smaller beings at will and that Farina was a fragment of Agaria? Well, she might not be Agaria's only fragment. Perhaps Agaria split off Farina to play the part of an Archon, the lead actress in a never-ending play. Couldn't Farina split as well? Wouldn't Farina just be able to split? Well, another fragment who was focused on justice and judgment would reside within the Oratrice to carry out a completely different task. The main body of Agaria likely left for the desert to face the Abyss and perish there, becoming the Sacred Lotus and the Amrita Pool. So what does that have to do with Child? Well, hold on, we're getting there. Egeria was known for having sympathy for the dragons, and this might be because she witnessed the ancient wars between the Oceanids and a civilization of dragons. At some point, those Oceanids and the dragons declared a truce, so her sympathy may have come from that period of peace. Perhaps she was able to establish a good relationship with either the previous Hydro Sovereign or young Nouvellette as a result. In fact, I have proposed previously that Nouvellet, or the previous Hydro Sovereign, was likely inspired by Numa Pompilius, a consort of Agarias from Greek mythology. He was kind of like her scribe and would record all of her teachings about the law. Now, if that's true, then in Genshin, Agaria and the Hydro Dragon, no matter which one it is, should share similar views of the law and likely similar opinions on justice. So if a fragment of Agaria is inside of the Oratrice along with the Gnosis, the unbroken consensus between Nouvellet and the Oratrice would make sense, and it would even explain why Nouvellet ruled that child was innocent of the crime of dissolving women in primordial waters, while the Oratrice declared him guilty. As the Udex, Nouvellet hears the arguments from both the prosecution and the defense, and makes the appropriate ruling based on the evidence presented. And, based on the evidence presented in court, Child was indeed innocent beyond a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, that's what we but think. But the Oratrice yeah. that's may what we have thought. access to a different type of evidence, something that escapes the gaze of everyone else, including Nouvellet. Remember how I said the people of Fontaine might be hydro eidolons mimicking dead humans? Well, let's assume that this is true for a moment. Let's assume Agaria made a mistake and everyone died. And in her grief, she ended up creating a new race of humans out of her hydro eidolons, or maybe her tears. Remember this book that talked about the origins of Oceanids and how there were two stories about them? One saying that Oceanids existed longer than Agaria and another saying that they were born from her tears? Well, 
both might be true. Agaria could be an oceanid from a whole ancient race of oceanids, and the oceanids that were born of her tears were actually those hydro eidolons that took the shapes of humans after all of the humans in Fontaine drowned. And what's Jesus. wild about this idea is that it has to have happened hundreds of years prior to the cataclysm. Why is this, you might ask? Because the kids from the Nartz and Kreutz world quest were already around several years before the cataclysm happened. And that matters because they have the symptoms of being hydro eidolons. Now, if you didn't do the Nartz and Kreutz world quest, then uh, spoiler warning, I guess. Pause <laughs> the video and go do the damn quest and then come back. <laughs> I will wait for you. Not that long, but I'll wait. But if you did do the Why quest, then let me draw your attention to Renee and Jacob. <laughs> Renee makes a claim that his and Jacob's bodies are fundamentally different from that of their caretaker, Carl Ingold. In fact, Renee believes their bodies are similar in composition to the sacred lotus, which is the remains of Egeria. Now, originally, I took this to mean that Renee and Jacob were special, but actually, I now think that this is evidence that Renee and Jacob are native Fontanians and fragments of Egeria. Hydro Eidolons, and that's why their body composition matches that of the Lotus left behind by Agaria. It's not Renee and Jacob huh. that's special, it's Carl Ingold who isn't native to Fontaine and therefore likely has a different body composition. If you follow this line of thought, then Renee's research starts to make a lot more sense. He figured out how to absorb people's memories and abilities like an oceanid. He discovered how to merge with people like an oceanid, and he had plans to literally transmute all of Fontaine into one giant oceanid. Jesus. So if everyone in Fontaine was actually just a hydro eidolon, then what Rene was doing wasn't changing the structure of the human body, but just discovering his original roots and how to utilize the unique properties of their bodies. It would explain why he required the help of Lyris, an oceanid, in order to do all of this, and why Marianne was able to be turned into a baby oceanid after she died. It would also explain why the victims of Vacher were able to turn into an oceanid as well. They were already hydro eidolons. They're all hydro eidolons. None of them are real. And this is the part where I get oh really upset at the God. biology of the whole thing because, like, Kaveh's mother, Faranak, should be a normal human. And she went to marry a man from Fontaine. And now I'm sat here wondering if any possible children of that union would have human flesh, water flesh, or, like, half and half, like, really watery <laughs> human flesh. And if they were exposed to primordial waters, would they just, like, slowly melt into goo under the influence? Or would they melt entirely? Or would they be completely immune? Like, I, I, I don't know what to think. And this just upsets me. <laughs> Sorry, I oh. got a little distracted. This biology here just really annoys me. But my point here is that there's evidence oh, of hydro island people before the cataclysm, meaning Agaria must have done whatever she did ages ago, maybe even way back during the Archon War. Or maybe she was trying to fix the mistake of Remus, the guy that basically destroyed his entire civilization. So why does this matter in regards to Child's verdict? because Child is connected to the primordial waters. He possesses a similar power inside of him, and since the primordial waters He's dissolve it, yeah. people, it doesn't matter whether or not Child himself actively tried to dissolve those people. He is guilty by default because the primordial waters themselves are guilty of the crime, and if those powers are inside of him, then he is guilty as well. And oh, oh. Boy, the rationale for this one is going to take some explaining, so hold on. Let me get ready here. So, the Oratrice is judging him based on that he has prim primordial wood inside of him? Oh, shit. If you were lucky enough ah, to shit. be around during the Shadows Admit Snowstorm event, you oh. might rem remember no. this really weird exchange that we had with Albedo where he said the following. Is creation an arrogant act, Traveler? If not... Why do we call the ones that created us and control us gods? If it is, then what qualifies us to call ourselves creators? How far must we take our reverence and respect? And what purpose does it serve? 
To put it another way, Albedo mm. could be asking if creation itself is a sin, if those who create are considered sinners, and if gods are allowed to create, then what is the difference between a god and a sinner? I would argue that there's probably not much difference. If you think about it, we haven't heard anything about I any everyone gods is bored apart with from the primordial one being allowed to create human life. Humans were very precious to the primordial one, so I do wonder if they considered Agaria's act of Hydro Eidolons mimicking humans a sin. Because, like, and maybe this is crazy, but this stuff is literally called primordial water, okay? Primordial, yes. as in the primordial one, or as in primo gems, primordial gems, you know, those stupid wishy things that all have the same color scheme as this weird butt water. Yeah, oh my know, god, it does have the same color. What the fuck? Conspiracy theory has gone on so far that I'm <laughs> relying on color theory now. But, like, this would make total sense if Agaria did the thing that I'll bait. Do you say we got infinite primo gems? Is that, is that, what, is that what you're saying? Infinite wishes? <laughs> arrogant and created her own humans because then the primordial one would have gotten seriously po'd and sent a flood of primordial water to wipe them all out as punishment but agaria probably wouldn't have liked that so she you know maybe with the help of the former hydro sovereign forced back the tides and then locked it away eventually sending people to guard the seal and then they eventually built the fortress of meripede right on top of it heck maybe that's how the previous hydro sovereign died trying to seal the primordial waters. When we first got to Fontaine, a child yeah. told us about the time when he was a kid and fell into yeah. the abyss and saw this huge whale that left him breathless. Then Skirk, his abyss master, said that pieces of it remained within him, which is why yes. she took an interest in him in the first place. I took this to mean that she was, you know, looking at some kind of crazy abyssal power within him, but now I think she might have meant that he had primordial power. After all, we've seen a ton of people get infected with abyss juice and live to tell about it, so it's nothing special. But we haven't seen a single person infected by primordial juice. So it would uh -oh. make sense if Skirk would find this peculiar situation a bit more interesting. Uh, but I, this that's also actually... means that the whale child saw is a primordial whale, not an abyssal one. The whale might be the physical form of the primordial waters, a kind of sentient form, kind of like how the oceanids create mimics out of hydro. And we know that Agaria locked the primordial waters deep under the ground beneath Meripede, and the underground of Tevat is the entrance to the abyss, a place where both space and time are a little funky, which means that Child's Whale was a primordial whale that was locked in the abyss. And that primordial whale was likely sent to enact the primordial one's judgment upon Agaria and her people for her sin of creation. Okay, this is a bit off topic, but I cannot wait till we meet her again. I cannot wait till we meet uh, the heavenly principles again. I cannot wait. I cannot. Oh, I'm you. Oh, that's what I clicked. In the abyss. And that primordial whale was likely wait. sent to enact the primordial one's judgment upon Agaria and her people for her sin of creation. Now I say all of this because in the Bible, the Leviathan is a sea monster who is the embodiment of chaos and who eats the damned when they die. But in Hebrew, which is the original language for the Bible, the word for Leviathan is Leviathan, and that just so happens to be the same word used for whale. Really, Hebrew uses the same word oh. for whale as Leviathan even outside of the Bible because the terms are completely synonymous with each other. However, How? we're all pretty sure that Nuvolet is also a Leviathan, but he's more of the serpent kind, not the whale kind. And as the Hydro Sovereign, his job is to bring judgment, something that fits with the role of the Leviathan in the Bible. But given that the Primordial One is an enemy of the dragons, wouldn't it be interesting if they decided to create a Primordial Liviathan to enact their judgment in place of the Hydro Sovereign? And Gosh. if that's true, then the verdict Child receives in court makes perfect sense. He is the constellation of the whale. His harbinger rank of 11 means chaos in biblical numerology. He's had contact with the primordial whale and its power remained within him, a power that could literally destroy Fontaine. 
The Egeria inside the Oratrice may have recognized this power and thus declared him guilty, locking him away inside of Meripede with the rest of the primordial waters. So he can't do any so damage. So with all that in mind, Jeez. what exactly is Farina's role in all of this? Well, I, I kill him. <laughs> Not, no, I'm joking. Uh, but I got me that. Jesus, I, I did not think of holy moly. This is the fact good. that Farina couldn't sense anything like that at all in Child just furthers the argument that her role is mostly that of a figurehead. She seems to lack any real power. She's got all the vibes of a theater kid. She relies on Nouvellet for protection, has intense insecurities, and seems to be completely in the dark about how the Oratrice, a machine she allegedly built, operates. And I think this is an intentional part of Agaria's plan. The prophecy she left Farina with, that all of Fontaine would dissolve until Farina was the only one left, reads more like a cautionary tale, like this is what could happen if we fail kind of thing. When Agaria allegedly split Farina off of herself before the cataclysm, she likely split Farina into two pieces. One piece would contain all of her divinity and reside within the Oratrice with the Gnosis, while the other would be no different from a Hydro Eidolon in a human shape. That's kind of what I said before, like, I mean, I said that Farina would have split herself. That's what, that, that's what I said before. The Gnosis, while the other would be no different from a Hydro Eidolon in a human shape, masquerading as an Archon to keep up the illusion that everything's just fine and dandy. <laughs> Yeah. She's kind of like a doll set upon a stage that's cursed to never stop dancing. This is what I believe her so-called curse is. So Farina continues to roleplay as an Archon while Nouvellette runs the whole operation on the administrative side of things, and Farina's divinity sits within the Oratrice with the Gnosis quietly harvesting incredible amounts of indemnidium from the trials. And this is where Agaria might be making a very big brain play. Indemnidium gets its name from indemnity, which is like uh, compensation money or like legal reparations. It's kind of like a fine you pay for a crime that you've committed or compensation for damages that were made on your behalf. But in biblical terms, right. maybe we should call this payment for your sins. If the Primordial One declared Agaria a sinner for her act of creation, then perhaps her plan has been to seal away her judgment just long enough to gather enough compensation to either pay off her assumed debt, or maybe she intended to gather this energy as a power that could actively counter the Primordial Waters, given enough time, thus freeing her people for good. Farina's presence here is important because she needs to keep up the hype for the courtroom to generate interest in the legal system explicitly for the purpose of having their energy harvested for indemnidium. And should she fail, she would regain her divinity, remaining a lonely archon with no people to govern. Should she succeed, she may just gain her freedom from playing her role of an archon and become something like a normal girl which would make Farina the most human of any Archon thus far. This theory Jeez. wasn't entirely my idea. Like I said earlier, I saw a couple oh of threads on Reddit about it and wrote them off right away, but as I was sifting through all the evidence that we had on hand while I was trying to figure out what was up with Farina, I realized that those theories might actually be right. So in the end, this kind of turned out to be more of like an expansion of those Reddit theories rather than something I cooked up completely by myself. I will leave links to those ones that I remember reading in the description box if you want to see the originals. Now I have a couple of thoughts to share while my channel members scroll on by. Don't forget to wave and say hi. Hi. So one thing that really bugged no, me when I first started on this theory was this whole thing with why these Hydro Eidolon people could get visions, especially if Celestia or the Primordial One thought of them as abominations that they wanted to purge. Sure. Frankly, I no longer think that Celestia is responsible for handing out visions, and all kinds of elemental beings and non-humans can already gain visions, so why not a Hydro Eidolon? If you want more of my reasoning as to why uh, responsible for handing out visions and all kinds of elemental beings and non-humans can already gain visions, so why not a Hydro Eidolon? If you want more of my reasoning as to why Celestia isn't responsible for vision distribution, please check out this video I made on the dragons and their connection to vision power. 
There's a link in the description, but the short version is that I think oh my God, yeah, I remember. visions are connected to dragons specifically, and since dragons and Celestia are at odds with each other, then the presence of the primordial whale resonating with the power within Child might have sent his vision out of whack. I think the only real loose end here is Nuvolet's ability to force back the primordial waters, but not purge them completely. I think this is because dragons naturally stand in opposition to the primordial one, so I think this is a little less about Nuvolet having control over the water, and more that he just has enough power as the Hydro Sovereign to compete with it. It's like mm. one Leviathan versus another, and right now they're merely at a stalemate, like they're at comparable power levels. However, should Nuvolet be able to recover his full authority via what we saw in his voice line that he does via regaining the hydronosis, <laughs> he might just be able to push them back for good. He said he does, doesn't he? Didn't he from that? Which does beg the question as to why Agaria didn't just give him the gnosis in the first place, but you know. That might be because Nuvolet isn't human, and she may have been afraid that he'd just, you know, wipe out all the Hydro Eidolon people as a form of his own judgment because he doesn't <laughs> care much about them. Oh, no. My uh -oh. guess is that he'd need an incentive to just not destroy them in the first place, and maybe providing that incentive was also Farina's job. Who knows? But I swear to God, if this theory turns out to be true, I'm, I, 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 don't, I don't know what I'm gonna say. I'm, I'm just, I want to say I'm gonna like eat my shoe or something, but Apollo's <laughs> a crafty son of a gun, and I am scared of him. So I'll probably just like, I don't know, cover my face in peanut butter and let my dogs lick it off. That is both <laughs> feasible and extremely uncomfortable. I am not a Kong toy. <laughs> The fuck? Anyway, thank you what? all so much for watching, and a special thanks to my channel members for supporting me and all of my okay. delusions. You are the channel members for supporting me and all of my delusions. You are the absolute best. She had Take fun care, making guys. this video. See you next time. Bye bye. God, Ashika had fun making this video. Jesus, with the oh my god, I still remember the oh, step icon. I'm stuck. Oh. God, that's still in my brain. Bro, I did not expect her to fuck. She had fun making this video. She had fun making this video. But, gotta be honest, I it actually makes a lot of sense. Gotta be honest, it does make a lot of sense. I am definitely gonna pull for Farina when she comes out. Like, I've saved up so many primos, so I think I'm guaranteed to get Farina, even if I lose the 50-50. I am guaranteed to get her. I, I, I want her so bad, and I'm hoping Charlotte is on her banner as well, so I can, while putting for Freena, I can get Charlotte as well. But I think, yeah, this does make sense. There's... Oh, wait. I swear I've watched this one. But um, I feel like, yeah, it does make sense. Gotta be honest, it does make sense. But I hope everyone did enjoy, and sorry I couldn't do this on stream, because uh, my internet cut out. I'm sorry about that, but... Jeez, this, uh, I feel like this theory has a quite a high chance of being right. I feel like it does have a very high chance of being right because it makes it actually like makes so much sense. I need to watch that again. Or like you would like Ashkai theories, you need to watch multiple times for it to make any sense <laughs> because it's just they're so long and so much like information that you kind of have to watch it multiple times. Like, Jesus Christ, like, there's so much. But, yeah, I hope everyone did enjoy it, and, yeah, see everyone in the next one. Bye!